बगल कंट्री हो ये रिसोर्ट क्या रहीम नाउ स्टार्टिंग द लोअर पार्ट ऑफ द एबडोम पैलवेस दैट वेयर लाइज दिस रीजन यू कैन से दैट द पैलवेस इज जस्ट द लोअर पार्ट ऑफ द एबडोम इट इज कंटिन्यूस विद एबडोम and it is considered as a lower part of the abdomen now this pelvis is formed or it is composed of uh, certain bones there are four bones mainly the two hip bones on the lateral side and then there is the sacrum and the coccyx so this bony pelvis just contains supports and protects the pelvic organs why it is called pelvis the meaning of the pelvis is just a basin shaped structure so there are certain pictures of the basin like this so the term basin means the bowl that contains or that holds the liquid so this shape of the pelvis is like this bowl you see here that the type the top of the bowl is open whereas on either side anteriorly and posteriorly it is bounded by bones muscles certain ligaments and the partial covering like the pelvic fascia and the parietal peritoneum of the pelvic region again see this bowl the bottom of the bowl is closed so every structure in the pelvis is like this one so this whole pelvis is further divided by a bony landmark into the lesser pelvis and into the greater pelvis now this bony marking is just called as the pelvic brim so there are several colors which indicates the boundaries of the pelvic brim so right from posterior to anterior press out that this structure is called as the sacral promontory then it is continue as the ala of sacrum this is a posterior boundary of the pelvic brim and this promontory and this green line indicates the ala of sacrum or the parts of the sacral bone then there is this red line this red line is continue and just converted into this blue line this one is called as the arcuate line or the iliopectinal line now this part is just on the inner aspect of the ilium and it is continue with the pubic crest or the pectin pubis and anteriorly the brim is completed by the superior surface of the pubic symphysis so again see here that these are the bones that contribute in the formation of the bony pelvis the pelvis is further divided by means of a landmark and this landmark is called as the pelvic brim pelvic brim is bounded posteriorly by the promontory and the ala of sacrum laterally on either side it is bounded by the arcuate line or the iliopectinal line this one red and blue and anteriorly this one is the superior surface of the pubis why it is called pelvis from where this term is inspired as i told you the basin means just a bowl bowl that contains or hold the liquid now this whole bony pelvis by means of this uh, pelvic brim is now divided into upper and lower part the upper part is wider one this area and it is called as a greater pelvis or the false pelvis whereas the area of the pelvis that lies just below this pelvic brim is called as the true pelvis or the minor pelvis true pelvis or the minor pelvis 
Now this false pelvis or greater pelvis is considered as the lower part of the abdomen. It is considered as the lower part of the abdomen. So from this picture again see the boundaries of the greater pelvis or the false pelvis. You can say that posteriorly it is bounded by the lumbar vertebrae. So just above the sacrum there is a row of the lumbar vertebrae and laterally on either side the false pelvis is bounded by the inner aspect of the ilium. So this one is the inner aspect of the ilium containing the iliac fossa and this part. So the part of the hip bone that lies above the arcuate line bounds the lateral wall of the greater pelvis. That is anteriorly. The greater pelvis or the false pelvis is bounded by the lower part of anterior abdominal wall. And remember, all structure lies just above the pelvic rim. So in this picture, you only see the lateral walls, which are formed by the ilium. Posteriorly, you can say here is the continuation of the row of five lumbar vertebrae. And anteriorly here is the attachment of the anterior abdominal wall. So anterior abdominal wall, lumbar vertebrae, and the ilium contributes in the formation of the greater pelvis or the false pelvis. Clinically, when you compare the greater pelvis with the lesser pelvis or the false pelvis with the true pelvis, you can say it is not significant or it is less significant. But of course, it is the lower part of the abdomen. So it protects and supports the abdominal contents. It has also a role uh, during pregnancy and the labor. You can say that it protects the gravid uterus. This lower part of the abdomen, which is considered as the false pelvis or greater pelvis, protects or supports the gravid uterus. Gravid uterus means the uterus containing the fetus. So it supports the gravid uterus after the third month of the pregnancy. After the third month of the pregnancy, and same greater pelvis during the early stage of labor also guides the fetus towards the true pelvis. So these are just a few functions and they all are protective functions for the abdominal contents. If there is pregnancy, the role begins after third month of the pregnancy. And then there is the role of pushing the head of fetus in the early stage of the labor. Now this uh, pelvic brim is also called as the pelvic inlet. Pelvic inlet. Inlet means entrance into this cavity. Now see this area. Comparatively, this one is shorter, bony canal, through which the fetus passes during the labor and this bony canal is called as the true pelvis. It is bounded by means of the pelvic inlet, the upper boundary, and the lower boundary is called as the pelvic outlet. I will show you the separate pictures. Between the inlet and outlet, the short cavity is called as the pelvic cavity. It's called as the pelvic cavity. Now, see here. This is just a picture of the male and female pelvis. And these are the contents of the pelvis. What lies in the pelvis? The pelvis contains the lower parts of the GIT, the lower parts of the renal system, or the structures that found in the lower part of the gastrointestinal tract, and the urinary system, and the internal genital organs. In the case of the female, this one is the uterus, the ovary, the fallopian tubes. This one is the part of the GIT called as the rectum, continue as the anal canal, the urinary bladder, the urethra. So these all are the contents of the pelvis in case of the female. Whereas in this picture, there is no uterus, 
there is no any ovary just there is the rectum there is a presence of the bladder and this male internal genital organ which is called as the prostate and just above the prostate in the same position lies the urinary bladder and its continuation is called as the urethra so these all are the different structures that found in the pelvis and they are called as the pelvic organs or the pelvic viscera these viscera are protected by the bony wall of the pelvis again this is a superior view of the pelvis containing the female genital organs in front you can see that this one is a urinary bladder in the middle position there lies the uterus and exactly posteriorly you will see the line for the rectum these are the sides of the female pelvis this uh, blue structure is called as the ovary and this is the area or the outline for the fallopian tube leading towards the uterus now look at this picture this one is the position or the orientation of the pelvis that how it is located within the body in the standing anatomic position in the standing anatomic position see here how it lies now this yellow line indicates the orientation of the pelvis this is the oblique line and this one is the standing anatomic position this one is the standing anatomic position in which when we see the location or exact position of the pelvis you can say that the pelvis lies in, a, in an oblique plane so this one is oblique plane from posterior towards the anterior aspect and this obliquity is about 60 degree it is about 60 degree with the ground or with the horizon in case of the female there is a structure which lies exactly in the same plane guess about that structure that would structure lies in this line this is an imaginary line but you can say exactly in this line lies the pelvis so pelvis is slightly tilted it not lies just in the line of the vertebral column this one is the lower part of the vertebral column it's called as the sacrum this red area indicates the position of the coccyx and these are the different parts right from the posterior aspect to the anterior aspect so this imaginary line will show you that anatomically the position of the pelvis is like this in case of the female there is a structure which lies exactly in the same plane and this one is called as a vagina what i told you about uh, this uh, yellow line that this yellow line indicates the position location or the orientation of the pelvis in the standing anatomic position again see other pictures for the explanation of the same things see in this picture again this is the orientation of the pelvis we are talking about the true pelvis as i told you the true pelvis is bounded above by the inlet and below by the outlet between these two landmarks there is a cavity now look at this picture this whole one is the pelvis in anatomical position identify this part of the hip bone and this part of the hip bone is called as the anterior superior spine and then identify this area which lies on the superior ramus of the pubis and called as the pubic tubercle so this one is the pubic tubercle and when you trace the pubic tubercle towards the midline you will find the pubic symphysis and articulation between the bodies of two pubic bones and see this plane this plane or this uh, light blue color indicates the vertical plane the purpose is this that the anterior superior spine and the pubic tubercle or the pubic symphysis lies in the same vertical plane that's why we say that the pelvis is tilted downwards 
and it is oriented in oblique direction. So this is just a one plane, vertical plane. And these are the two bony structures which lies in the same plane. What are those bony structures? One, that one is the anterior superior spine. Second landmark is the pubic tubercle. See another picture? Now again, look at this picture and see that the coccyx, this one is the area of the coccyx. So the coccyx and the pubic symphysis lies in the same horizontal plane. The pubic tubercle and the coccyx lies in the same horizontal plane. You can understand well from this picture, this A line indicates on either side the position of the coccyx. So this one is the tip of the coccyx. And this is just the pubic tubercle or the beginning of the pubic symphysis. And both lies in the same horizontal plane. See this plane B. This plane B is vertical in direction. It is vertical in direction. And what lies uh, at this plane? The two structures I told you, that one is the anterior superior spine and second one is the pubic tubercle. Now when you draw a line from inlet outlet, you can say that the pelvis is lies in an oblique plane. Pelvis lies in an oblique plane. And this oblique plane is about 60 degree to the horizon of the ground. Now again, see this picture, it will show you certain colors and these colors differentiate the parts of the pelvis. The green color lies just above the red uh, color perimeter. So this one is a red color perimeter, which indicates the position of the pelvic inlet or the pelvic brim. The structure is same, just there is change in the name. Otherwise, the boundaries are same, the sacral promontory then there is the ala of sacrum, then there is the iliopectinal line and the pubic symphysis. So this green color indicates the area of the greater pelvis or the false pelvis. See here that it is white at its upper end or it flares when it reaches towards the abdomen. So this greater pelvis is considered as the part of the abdomen. It is considered as the part of the abdomen. When you think on the right side of the greater pelvis, you can say here lies the cecum. Here lies the cecum. And remember that the diverticulum of the cecum is called as the appendix. The second common position of the appendix is called as the pelvic position because it uh, hangs downward from the posterior medial surface of the cecum in this direction. That's why it is called as the pelvic position of the appendix. In case of the left leg fossa, again the part of the greater pelvis. Now this area is just related to the sigmoid colon. This area is mainly related to sigmoid colon. There are other structures also, but this area which is called as the right leg fossa, they are just related mainly to the cecum and the appendix. So simply we can say that the greater pelvis, just lower part of the abdomen are considered as the part of the abdomen. Now again, revise your memory, recall your memory. What I told you regarding to the boundaries of the greater pelvis are the false pelvis, are the major pelvis, that posteriorly it is bounded by the lumbar vertebrae, laterally on either side by the ilium, and anteriorly by the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall. Everything just that, that uh, lies just above this red line is called the greater pelvis. Now below the pelvic brim, the remaining part of the pelvis is called the true pelvis. We remember the true pelvis, we read the true pelvis just by three main headings. One is called pelvic inlet, Pelvic inlet is nothing. This is just the pelvic brim. 
and the second one is called as the pelvic outlet and then there is a cavity that found between the inlet and outlet which is called as the pelvic cavity again look at this picture the one indicates the greater pelvis the letter two indicates the the number two indicates the lesser pelvis see here that this is the area which is called as the pelvic brim these are the lumbar vertebrae these are the lumbar vertebrae and see the term pelvis it means this is the area of the greater pelvis posteriorly and this one on either side is the area or the boundary of the greater pelvis on either side or laterally and it is formed by the ilium mainly the iliac fossa or the part of the ilium or the inner surface of the ilium that found above the pelvic brim and what lies anteriorly you can think that anteriorly there is a lower part of the anterior abdominal wall the greater pelvis i told you three important functions that it just uh, supports or protects the abdominal contents when there is pregnancy then after the third month of the pregnancy it supports the gravid uterus gravid uterus means the uterus containing fetus so when the uterus grow containing the fetus that uh, after third month it reaches in the region of the greater pelvis and finally near to the pregnancy the contraction of the abdominal muscles or the contraction of the wall of the gravid the gravid uterus pushes the fetus into this bony canal which is called as the true pelvis which is called as the true pelvis what i told you about the pelvis and what is the shape of the pelvis the shape of the pelvis is like this like a bowl or the basin shaped see here the top of the basin or the top of the bowl is just just open there is no any this structure but this is a rounded boundary this curved boundary indicates a position of the indicate the position of the pelvic brim now see the bottom of this bowl it is closed and here lies the muscles which form the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm uh, you can say that when we further divide the pelvis there is a small region that found below the pelvic diaphragm and see this line it is just called as the perineum just called as a perineum but it lies below the pelvic diaphragm so the bottom is closed and its top is open this is the anterior wall this is the posterior wall this one is the this one is the lateral wall on one side and this is the lateral wall on other side same structure here just see recall your memory region of the greater pelvis just above this uh, multicolored line and what's a multicolored line it is called as the pelvic brim just for the division of the true pelvis true pelvis and false pelvis or this is alternately called as the pelvic inlet pelvic inlet or the pelvic boundary or pelvic brim the boundaries are same these all are the bony landmarks begins from here start from here this yellow color show you this uh, slight bulging margin within the pelvic cavity and this one is just the bulging margin of the first sacral vertebra it's called as the promontory on either side this green line is continue on the second part of the sacrum which is called as the ala of sacrum and this one is the arcuate line continue from right and then it is continued into the pubis called as the pectin pubis is still continue to form the pubic crest so this collectively called as the this one collectively called as the linea terminalis not given in your book but this whole one is the iliopectinal line iliopectinal line is just the alternate term of the linea terminalis so how this linea terminalis is formed the first is the arcuate line on the ilium 
second is the pectin pubis on the superior ramus of the pubis and third one is the pubic crest which lies just on the upper part of the body of the pubic bone and the bodies of the pubis are just articulated in the midline to form this green structure which is called as the pubic symphysis pubic symphysis is a secondary cartilaginous joint secondary cartilaginous joint again look at this picture beside other functions the main function of the pelvis is to just transmit the weight transmit the weight of the body transmit the weight of the body from the vertebral column to the femur through a joint which is called as a sacroiliac joint again this point is given in your books that it contains it supports it protects the lower parts of the git or the organs that found in the lower part of the urinary system or the internal genital organs in the male as well as in the female but overall the main function of the pelvis is just transmit the weight of the body through the vertebral column into the femur which articulate with the acetabulum and by means of a joint and this joint is called as a sacroiliac joint so the constituent bones of the pelvis articulate with each other at three joints see here posteriorly there is sacrum and the coccyx between the sacrum and coccyx a joint is formed and this one is called as the sacrococcygeal joint this sacrococcygeal joint is a secondary cartilaginous joint it possesses slight movements there is another joint a big joint responsible for the wet of transmission because sacrum is the part of the vertebral column and from the hip the weight enters into the femur so this one is the sacroiliac joint it is formed by this broad area of the sacrum on either side so broad area that found on either side of the body of the sacrum or simply called as the ala of sacrum so this uh, margin of the ala sorry this uh, articular surface of the ala just articulates with the auricular surface of the ilium to form the sacroiliac joint so these are the joints which are formed between the sacrum and coccyx between the sacrum and ilium and there is an other joint anteriorly which is formed between the bodies of the two pubic bones in the midline anteriorly just called as the pubic symphysis pubic symphysis orientation of the pelvis or the inlet or the cavity mainly indicates are mainly reserved for the true pelvis the true pelvis is not situated vertically because it different parts lies in different planes so the overall position of the pelvic cavity is oblique 60 degree with the horizon or the ground so this is a picture would show you the correct uh, position of the pelvis the means of the vertical planes denoted by the term a and b you can see here everything is clear now and uh, see this picture recall your memory think about the different names of the greater pelvis and the lesser pelvis greater pelvis is called as the false pelvis or the major pelvis the lesser pelvis is called as the true pelvis or the minor pelvis the bony canal approach the fetus passes during the delivery or during the birth is the lesser pelvis see the boundaries of the false pelvis they are simple boundaries and they are clear once again in this picture that posteriorly is formed by the lumbar vertebrae posteriorly by the lumbar vertebrae on either side by the iliac fossae and iliac fossae gives uh, origin to the iliacus muscle so it is included also among the boundary of the greater pelvis on the lateral side anteriorly 
is just the lower part of the intra-abdominal wall. And what's the main function of this greater pelvis? That it supports the abdominal contents. And when a lady becomes pregnant, and after the third month of the pregnancy, it supports the gravid uterus, uterus containing the fetus. And during the early stages of labor, it uh, guides the fetus towards the bony canal or towards the true pelvis. When we think about the true pelvis, then these are the boundaries of the true pelvis. One is inlet, other is outlet. Outlet is also called as the floor. And in the living position, the floor is sealed by means of the muscles and fascia. It's called as the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm. And between the inlet and outlet, a cavity, a short bony canal is uh, formed, which possess walls anteriorly, posteriorly, and the laterally. Again, see this picture. Uh, there is uh, everything. Everything is there. That uh, this green arrow indicates the abdominal cavity. Now, see here that just below this line. The red color indicates the position of the greater pelvis, and this blue arrow indicates the position of the true pelvis. But see here that this green arrow is continued from the abdominal cavity into the greater pelvis or the false pelvis. So we can say that this uh, greater pelvis is just the lower part of the abdominal cavity. You can see here that this one is the line on either side for the pelvic inlet and these are the areas for the outlet. Between the inlets and outlet, the so-called this short bony canal is called as the pelvic cavity. Pelvic cavity of what? False are true, the true pelvis. And see here that just below the pelvic diaphragm, just below the pelvic outlet, still there is a small area in the lowermost part of the abdomen, this one is called as the perineum. This one is called as the perineum. We are not in the perineum. We are just discussing the pelvis. So kindly see once again the boundaries for the pelvic inlet. The same for the pelvic brim. The pelvic inlet, as in this picture, is bounded posteriorly by the sacral promontory. On either side, laterally, it is bounded by the iliopectinal line and anteriorly, this one is formed by means of the anterior border of the pubic symphysis. You can see this picture, you will see a complete pelvis. The bony components of the pelvis, posteriorly and then anterolaterally. Posteriorly, just the two bones. And what are these two bones? This wedge-shaped piece of the bone, which is made up of the four rudimentary pieces of the sacral vertebrae called as the sacrum. And it here articulated with this triangular-shaped piece of the bone, again made up of the four rudimentary pieces of the uh, coccyx. So posteriorly the sacrum and coccyx, whereas on the lateral side, there is ilium, the inner aspect of the ilium. Then there is the Continuously, there is the part of the there is the part of the ilium and the superior ramus of the pubis. So the pubis and ilium of the hip bone, sacrum and coccyx. Sacrum and coccyx lies posteriorly. Again, these are the boundaries of the pelvic inlet. I am repeating frequently. So remember the boundaries of the pelvic inlet. Always uh, BCQ comes from this area. They mention either one or the four wrong answers or the right answers. And they add uh, one or four wrong options. So remember the total bony marks that found in the region of the pelvic inlet. Now see the pelvic outlet. The pelvic outlet is diamond shaped. The pelvic outlet is diamond shape 
and this is bounded posteriorly by the coccyx. So where is the posterior aspect? This one is the posterior aspect. So this tip of the coccyx or this whole area of the coccyx on the tip and the sides form the posterior boundary of the structure which is called as the pelvic outlet. Laterally on either side, the pelvic outlet is completed by the ischial tuberosities and anteriorly the outlet is completed by means of this uh, triangular shape green area which is called as the pubic arch. A white gap between the ischio pubic rama is called as the pubic arch. So this pubic arch that found between the body and the ischio pubic rama anteriorly the ischial tuberosity is laterally and the coccyx posteriorly. These all are found in the pelvic outlet. These are the components of the pelvic outlet. You can see this blue structure. Now this blue structure is a ligament and this ligament is called as the sacrotuberous ligament. Its one end is attached on the ischial tuberosity and its uh, other end begins from these three areas, the side of the coccyx, the side of the sacrum, and the posterior inferior iliac spine. So this ligament medially begins from the side of the coccyx, side of the sacrum, and from the posterior inferior iliac spine, and then it is attached to the ischial tuberosity. Now this ligament is uh, thick, hard, inflexible. So it is uh, included among the structures that form the pelvic outlet. Now, after the inclusion of this sacrotuberous ligament, you can say that the whole pelvic outlet is diamond shaped. Whole pelvic outlet is diamond shaped. The pelvic outlet is diamond shaped. How this diamond is completed? How it is completed? It is completed when we add the sacrotuberous ligament. When we add the sacrotuberous ligament. Now we can say that this pelvic outlet or the posterior part of this diamond shaped pelvic outlet is formed by means of the coccyx then by means of the sacrotuberous ligament, sacrotuberous ligament, and anteriorly the diamond is formed by the, it is formed by the pubic symphysis, and then this uh, pubic arch, or leave the pubic symphysis, just mention the pubic arch and the ischial tuberosity. So this whole pubic arch, this whole pubic arch, including this ischial tuberosity anteriorly, sacrotuberous ligament and coccyx posteriorly. So diamond is complete or the shape of the diamond for the pelvic outlet is only possible when we add the sacrotuberous ligament among the structures that form the pelvic outlet. You see these pictures. So I keep this picture for the structures that found in the pelvic cavity and how the pelvic cavity is formed, or what are the structures that found in the pelvic cavity? What are the structures that found in the pelvic cavity? Just recall your memory. You can say that the pelvic cavity is formed by the bones. The structures that found in the pelvic cavity is formed by the bones, by the ligaments, and by the attachment of the muscles and partial covering of the pelvic fascia and the parietal peritoneum. They all collectively form the anterior, posterior, and lateral walls of the pelvis. Again, see the pelvic outlet. Which structure? 
the pelvic outlet. Now this whole pelvic outlet possesses three notches. One notch lies anteriorly, and this one is called as the pubic arch, and the two notches lies laterally. One is the greater sciatic notch, and other one is the lesser sciatic notch. Now this greater and the lesser sciatic notches lies laterally or just divided by this bony landmark which is called as the still spine and further they are converted into the foramina by means of the sacro tuberous and the sacro spinous ligament the sacro tuberous and the sacro spinous ligament these ligaments just convert the notches into the foramina but at this stage you must remember that in case of the bony pelvis the pelvic cavity possesses three notches one anteriorly two laterally and they are converted it means these two lateral notches are converted by the attachment of the sacro tuberous sacro tuberous and the sacro spinous ligaments into the greater and lesser sciatic foramina Well, this is a bone. Uh, these are the, just the bones that form the posterior wall of the lesser pelvis. Posterior wall of the true pelvis. And this one is just called as a sacrum, a large wedge shaped piece of the bone, articulate inferiorly with a triangular piece of the bone, which is called a coccyx. What are the Salient features, or what are the main features of the sacrum? You can say it is wedge shaped or triangular shaped. Its upper part is called as the base of the sacrum, and its inferior part is called as the apex of the sacrum. The base articulates with the fifth lumbar vertebra to form the lumbosacral, lumbosacral angle. So, I will show you a picture that why this uh, articulation between the fifth lumbar vertebra and the sacrum is called the lumbosacral angle. See here. This is just the fifth lumbar vertebra and this one is the line for the sacrum. The fifth lumbar vertebra articulate with the sacrum at this slight uh, projection or angulation they are not in just the same line therefore this tilt or this forward bend between the fifth lumbar and the first sacral vertebrae indicates the position of the lumbosacral angle so the lumbar region and the sacral region articulate with each other just by an angulation and this uh, bony landmark is called as the lumbosacral angle. Again see this picture of the sacrum and how the sacrum is formed. The sacrum is formed for the it is formed by the five rudimentary pieces of the sacral vertebrae. Five rudimentary pieces of the sacral vertebrae. Five rudimentary pieces of the sacral vertebrae, sacral vertebrae through the bodies just for ordinary vertebra. There is a body. This posterior part is called as a body here. Well, actually this one is the anterior part. Again, this whole structure beside the body is called as a vertebral arch. So anterior part of each vertebra is called as a body. And posteriorly, this curved area is called as the vertebral arch. Now, vertebral arch possesses this anterior part, which is called as the pedicle. Then there is the second part, which is called as the lamina. Pedicle and lamina fuse to form the lateral extensions on either side, called as the transverse process. And both lamina fuse in the midline to form a posterior projection which is called as a spinous process. Now see here that the union 
or the fuel between the vertebral arch and body is called as a vertebral foramen. It's called as the vertebral foramen. Now the lumbar vertebra, sorry, this uh, sacrum is formed by the rudimentary or the five rudimentary pieces of the sacral vertebrae. And anteriorly they appear like this. So this uh, midline portion is just the few between the individual bodies of the rudimentary lumbar vertebrae. One, two, three, and four, and five. On either side, of this few of the body, there are the apertures, and these apertures are called as the sacral foramina anteriorly, and the similar foramina on the posterior aspect. So this one is the posterior sacral foramina on the posterior aspect, and these all are the anterior sacral foramina on the anterior aspect of the sacrum. Now few of the remaining part of the vertebrae just on just next to the just next to the sacral foramina is called as the lateral moss or the ala of sacrum so ala of sacrum is just here next to the body and it is formed by the fused transverse processes of the sacral vertebrae so this whole area is called as the ala ala means the brain so until you can say that this one is the fuon of the bodies, on either side of the fuon there are the foramina, and next to the foramina you will see on both sides a fused moss which is called the lateral moss of the sacrum or the ala of the sacrum or just the wing. Now see this picture. This one is called as the vertebral foramina. Now the fuel of the vertebral foramina in this manner creates a canal and this canal is called as the sacral canal. So here is the vertebral foramina that when they fuse to form the sacrum, then they form a small canal right from the first sacral vertebra up to the fourth or fifth. And this whole one is called as the sacral canal. See this? Uh, lower opening of the sacral canal which is called as the sacral hiatus and the sacral hiatus is formed due to the failure of the fuon of the lamina between the fifth or sometimes the fourth lumbar vertebrae so when this lamina fails to fuse in the midline and which happens normally in case of the formation of the sacrum then this uh, lower margin is called as the sacral hiatus. This is the lower margin or the lower opening of the sacral canal. And how the sacral canal is formed? By the few of the vertebral foramen. Again, see here, this, this is the region of the pedicle. So rudimentary parts of the pedicle on either side form these downward projections just below the sacral hiatus and they are called as the sacral carnua. They are called as the sacral carnua. See this bone? This one is the coccyx. So like the sacrum, the coccyx is made up of the four rudimentary pieces of the coccygeal vertebrae. They are fused with each other like this. And this one is called as the, this area or the lateral extension is just the remnant of the transverse process of the first coccygeal vertebra. And this upward projection is just the rudimentary area or the remnant of the superior articular process and superior articular process and the pedicles of the vertebra. So again, see this picture. Where is the superior article process? These are the superior article processes. Here lies the pedicle. And the remnants of these two structures just uh, form the upward projections in the first coccygeal piece of the coccyx. And this one is called uh, the sacral. This, these are the sacral cardboard, and these upward projections are the coccygeal cardboard. 
and both articulate with each other. Sacral and the coccygeal carnua either articulate with each other by a fibrous joint or they are just connected with each other by ligaments. Now the sacral canal gives passage to certain structures. You can say that this whole space is filled with the fibrophagy tissue and it transmits certain structures which are given in this picture. So these all are the structures that you will see that passes through the sacral canal. These all are the structures that passes through the sacral canal. They are the, they are the roots of the lumbar, sacral, and the coccygeal nerve. They are the roots of the lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal spinal nerve. So these all structures collectively passes through the sacral canal. The upper part of the sacral canal also contains an other structure which is called as the subarachnoid space. So this is a space. This is the space on either sides of uh, this structure. Uh, this one is the lower part of the lower part of the lower part of the spinal cord. Projection is called as the conus medullaris, covered by the pia mater. Between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater, there is a space, and this space just terminates at the second sacral vertebrae. So this space is called as the subarachnoid space. Subarachnoid space. Then the continuation of the pia mater is continue throughout the sacral canal and now this one is called as a phylum terminal phylum terminal so these structures that i mentioned here the one is the roots of the lumbar the sacral and coccygeal spinal nerves then there is the phylum terminal and the subarachnoid space found or passes through the sacral canal. So look at this picture. They all passes. This is the territory of the sacrum. This whole one is the territory of the sacrum. This whole one is the territory of the sacrum. And this is space, this blue one is a space which is called a subarachnoid space containing the cerebrospinal fluid and it terminates just at the level of the second sacral vertebra. On either side of this space, you will see the structures like this, which are called as the spinal nerves, the lumbar, the sacral, and coccygeal. And then there is another structure that I told you and found here. And this one is called as the phylum terminal, the continuation of the pia mater and the termination of the spinal cord. It passes throughout the whole length of the sacral canal, passes through the sacral hiatus, and just fuses with the front of the coccyx, just fuses with the front of the coccyx. Now look at the lateral wall of the pelvis. What lies in the lateral wall of the pelvis? The lateral wall of the pelvis possesses the part of the hip bone, possesses the part of the hip bone that lies just below this uh, arcuate line or the iliopectinal or the linear terminals. So the part of the hip bone that lies below the pelvic brim, the obturator membrane and the attachment of the obturator internus muscle are included among the structures that found in the lateral wall of the pelvis found in the lateral wall of the pelvis this is the ilium again this is the part of the ilium but this part of the ilium lies just below this pelvic ring then there is the area for the superior ramus of the pubis body of the pubis then these are the areas which are called as the ischial ramus tuberosity of the ischium and this is the gap that is formed between the pubis and ischium of the hip bone, which is called as the obturator foramen. And this obturator, obturator foramen is just covered 
by membrane in the knife and this one is called as the obturator membrane. When you think about the muscles that found in the lateral wall of the pelvis, there are just two. The one is called the piriformis and the second one is called as the obturator internus. What I told you about the notches of the pelvic cavity, the two notches on the lateral side, one is called as the greater, other one is called the associated foramen. And how they are converted in foramen? They are converted into foramina by means of these two ligaments. This one ligament is called as the sacral tuberous, and this ligament is called as the sacro spinous ligament. So again, look at this uh, hip bone. What parts of the hip bone are included into the formation of the pelvis? This is the large part, which is called as the ala, or it is called as the iliac fossa, or the inner surface of the ilium. It contributes in the formation of the greater pelvis. Then this part contributes in the formation of the lesser pelvis. See this part of the hip bone, which is called as the ischium. Ischium lies posteriorly and inferiorly in the hip bone. And this is the pubis which lies anteriorly and inferiorly in the hip bone. So look at this picture. The hip bone, part is called ilium, upper superiorly, bounded above by the iliac crest, limited anteriorly and posteriorly by the anterior and posterior superior leg like spines. Inferiorly, there are also two other small projections called the anterior and posterior inferior like spines. Then there is the part of the hip bone which lies just posterior and inferior called as the ischium. So this one is the ischium. This is the ischial tuberosity and this one is called as the ramus of the ischium. Ischial tuberosity and ramus and this whole one is called as the body of the ischium. See here, this one is the body of the tubus inferior ramus, the superior ramus, the body of the ramus possesses two important bony landmarks. One is called as the pubic tubercle, other is called as the pubic crest. But remember that this obturator foramen is formed just between the two bones, not the three bones. That one is the pubis and the ischium. But this acetabulum is made up or contributed from the ilium, from the pubis, as well as from the ischium. This is the opening. This is the opening which is just covered by a membrane, which is called as the obturator membrane, which gives attachment to a structure which is called as the obturator internus, except at its upper part where a small opening is called as the obturator canal, through which passes, through which passes the obturator nerve to interest into the thigh. Now okay, we see these two muscles. The one is called as the obturator internus. And what is the origin of the obturator internus? That it arises from this whole obturator membrane and the surrounding hip bone and the surrounding hip bone. After getting origin, the muscle fibers convert into a cylindrical tendon and this tendon passes through the lesser sciatic foramen like uh, this one and then it enters and then it enters into the, then it enters into the superior part of the greater trochanter of the femur or the trochanteric fossa. So this is just the attachment of the obturator internus muscle. It is supplied by the nerve to obturator internus, a branch of the sacral plexus. If the actions are considered, you can say that this muscle is the lateral rotator of the thigh at the hip joint. Like that, another muscle which is called the piriformis, it also originates from the first three pieces of the sacrum. Or you can say that it arises from the ala of the sacrum next to these anterior pelvic foramina of the sacrum or the sacral pelvic foramina. And then the fibers of the piriformis muscle passes through the greater sciatic foramen 
and finally insert into the greater trochanter. Again, the action is same. That one is called as the lateral rotation of the thigh at the hip joint. And again, its nerve supply is from the sacral plexus. So called as the nerve to preformis. Called as the nerve to preformis. We we're just talking about the important uh, bony landmarks of the pelvis, like the greater pelvis, like the lesser pelvis, not the pelvic viscera. You see here that what are the different types, what are the different shapes of the pelvis, the different shapes of the pelvis. You know, the pelvis in 1933, in case of the female, is classified by these two gentlemen, the portrail and molloy. And according to this classification, the pelvis divided into four groups. The one group is called as a gynecoid. And it is a typical female pelvis, or it is ideal for the female, or it is ideal for the normal childbirth. Our second group of the pelvis is called as the android, found in 33% women. But it is called as the male pelvis. It is funnel shaped, comparatively narrow to the gynecoid. So it is mainly found in the male. But of course, it is also found in 33% population throughout the world in case of the woman also. A third type, which is oval shaped and possesses a long, narrow pelvic cavity is called as the anthropoid. The frequency rate of this uh, type of, or this group of the pelvis in 24%. And fourth one is called as the plecticulite pelvis found in 2% of the hormones. It is white pelvis, it is white and it is flattened at the brim. Means the pelvis brim is flat. So these are the pictures and commonly asked the, to the students that whether android pelvis found in the female or not. And with confidence every student say no sir this is a male pelvis never occurs into the female. So, every type of the pelvis found in the female, but with the ratio, with the frequency. In most of the women, this type of the pelvis is found, ideal for the childbirth, no any problem during the childbirth. But this type of the pelvis, which is called android, comparatively this one is narrow. This is also not ideal for the, this is not also ideal for the childbirth, comparatively to this one. And this is also same, not ideal for the child. So when the childbirth, childbirth occurs into these types of the women or the girls, then labor becomes difficult and called as a dystocia. So chances of the dystocia are more among the android, anthropoid, and the platypoid. Remember that every type may found in any woman, but this one is the majority of the cases. This is less frequent, this is less frequent, and this, is, this one is much less frequent in case of the female. Remember this uh, outline of the pelvic uh, inlet and the pelvic cavity? And about this uh, red line, which is called the axis of the legs, the central axis of the pelvis. So the central axis of the pelvis is just an imaginary line. This is just an imaginary line which passes through the central part, which passes through the central part of the pelvic inlet and the central part of the pelvic outlet. And it is slightly curved because the posterior wall of the pelvic cavity is curved due to the anterior concavity of the sacrum. So when you see the sacrum from the front, it is concave 
and posteriorly the sacrum is convex. So this concavity in the posterior wall of the pelvis is responsible for this curve of an imaginary line which is called as the central axis of the pelvis. And then see certain differences between the male and uh, female pelvis. What are few differences? These are the overall important differences between the male and female pelvis. Beside the classifications. So this one is the bony pelvis, the difference in male and female. When you see the bones individually in the male, they are thick and heavy. Compared to the female, they are thin and light. It's not for the bones of the pelvis, but every bone of the female is thin and light compared to the male which possesses the thick and heavy bones. See the pelvis major or the greater pelvis. Greater pelvis or pelvis major or the false pelvis. It's more deep, but in case of the female, it is shallow. The true pelvis, the true pelvis in case of the male, it is narrow and deep, but in case of the wide and shallow. So these are the few differences between the different parts of the pelvis in the male and female. The ideal pelvis is wide and shallow because this is for the true pelvis. See the inlet. The pelvic inlet in case of the male is heart shaped and in case of the female it is oval or rounded shape. I have one picture by which we see all these differences one by one. Then there is the pelvic outlet. In case of the male it is small case of the female it is larger then there is the pubic arch and the subpubic angle it is uh, narrow in case of the male and it is wide in case of the female obturator foramen less important but it is round in case of the male and oval in case of the female and the acetabulum is large in case of the male and small in case of the female now see this picture the pelvic inlet See the pelvic inlet in case of the female and male. In case of the male, it is uh, greater anterior posteriorly. It is large in diameter anterior posteriorly. This indentation posteriorly is due to the sacral promontory. So overall shape of the inlet in case of the male is heart shape. But the same structure in case of the female is just circular in outline. So this one is a circular in outline. Which thing, which structure inlaid? Now see the picture differences between the pelvic outline. Outline is same, outline is same, but it is more wider in case of the female. Comparatively, this one is narrow in case of the male. Pelvic cavity, a funnel shaped in case of the male, but in case of the female, it is just the white and the shadow. This one is large and narrow, this is white and shallow. Pubic arch in case of the female is white and the pubic arch in case of male is acute. Right? Yeah. Now please, uh, if you have any query, any question, Do you have any question, please? Sir, what is the significance of uh, that line 